Welcome to the Pit Rivers. This is Witch Bottle Live, and today we'll be unpacking what it means to have a witch bottle, what they mean, where they come from, who makes them, and we're going to be unpacking it with this brilliant team of experts who've got an AHRC project running currently at the moment, all about witch bottles. Now, a bit of a disclaimer, I know some of you have been very worried on social media about emptying the witch bottle and whether it's going to be uncorked for the very first time and will we unleash hell? Well, the answer is no, because the witch bottle that we're, we're looking at today has already been opened and the contents has already been looked at. But this is the first time that it's going to be looked at by a team of experts as part of this project. So, Nigel, can you actually tell me about your project? What, what are you doing with these bottles? Well, thanks, Raksha. Yeah, we're on a three-year project funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, which has allowed us to bring together experts from MOLA, so it's myself, Nigel Jeffries, um, Michael Marshall, uh, and um, from the University of Hertfordshire, Kerry Holbrook and uh, Professor Owen Davis. And we're looking at really uh, trying to sort of get a sense of recalibrating our understanding of the witch bottle practice uh, at its very origins in this country, in England, in the, in the mid to late 17th century. And we're doing that by exploring all facets of the practice, that is from looking at the chronology of the and the types of bottles which were used as containers for which bottles, um, as well as looking at the places in which they are found, uh, as well as looking at the most important part, which of course is the contents, and that's what makes them a witch bottle, uh, as well as looking at the uh, historical and uh, textual evidence which survives in um, you know, various accounts of um, the creation of these bottles, uh, or indeed in uh, recipe books from the time as well. Hence the inclusion of uh, my great Cohen's, my great colleagues Owen and uh, Kerry. So that's the other thing as well is you've been asking people, haven't you? How do you have a witch bottle? And you had a bit of a call to arms, didn't you? Absolutely. Uh, a few Absolutely. months ago, asking people if they'd actually found witch bottles. Yeah. I mean, a really important part of it is getting the sense of what this is as a national collection bring it together for the first time as a national collection. Uh, and so to do this, to enable this, when we first launched the project in 2019, that's when our funding started for it, is that we used the uh, hashtag which bottle live, uh, sorry, that's the hashtag we're using at the moment, sorry. Uh, you know, which bottle hunt, uh, you know, too many hashtags in my, in my head there. Uh, and uh, which bottle hunt, um, which we uh, posted out as a call out on social media on um, my workplace, Museum of London Archaeology's Twitter page. Uh, I mean, you know, failing that, people can use that as a, as a hashtag to uh, report their findings. Otherwise, they can just simply email me. That's fine as well. So they can look on the mola.org page, uh, Please send us your questions right now as well. We're looking at using hashtag Witch Bottle Live. So if you've got any questions, if you think you've got one, please send them through at the moment. That would be great. So Faye, you work at the Pit Rivers. You're a curator here. Is that right? Uh, yes, I am. So uh, I'm, the, I'm the deputy head of collections at the Pit Rivers Museum. And what about the collection here? It's amazing. Yeah, so the collection of the museum was founded in 1884 with the personal collection of um, Augustus Henry Lane Fox Pit Rivers. That is um, a mouthful. It is a bit of a mouthful. So he was a, a general but, um, in the British Army, but he had a big personal kind of fortune and wealth. Um, and he was also an antiqu antiquarian, so he collected um, archaeology, ethnographic objects, natural history specimens, all sorts of things really. Um, he was also actually a, a, an archaeologist himself, so he was responsible for excavating a lot of um, where he lived down in kind of Dorset and Somerset. Um, and so he had this big personal collection of around 25,000 objects, which he wanted to ho house in a museum. So he approached the University of Oxford um, and they took his collection, built a, a museum for it after his name. Um, he soon kind of lost um, interest in his collection at Oxford and went on to collect further and make his own museum down in um, Farnham and Dorset. Um, but since uh, then, after 1884, the collections were added to. Um, so today we've got around half a million things um, and were largely collected um, and added to by the first curator of the um, museum, Henry Balfour, um, who uh, found this jug, donated this uh, bottle in um, 1893 um, and also was responsible, I think, for acquiring this bottle from um, Warren, 
uh, Edward Warren in 1910. Um, and I think Warren and Balfour would have mixed in the same circles as the Pitt Rivers, um, at the Society of Antiquities, the Folklore Society. Um, Warren presented this bottle at a meeting of the Society of Antiquities, um, which I'm pretty sure Balfour would have been at as a kind of show and tell, mm. um, and then offered it to the museum um, in there's a, a lovely correspondence between Balfour and Warren. Warren saying, you know, it would be my absolute pleasure for me to come and show you this bottle and give it to you, send it to you so you could have it Gosh. for the museum. So, and I think they're here really in Oxford because of their association with uh, witchcraft, magic, sympathetic magic, folklore, um, more than anything else, because we have a really big collection. Um, focusing on that area. Right, so I'm a bit confused because I thought we were looking at one bottle today, but now we have two. So which one are we going to look at the contents of? Uh, so we are going to empty um, the 1893 bottle um, from Norwich. Uh, so the bottle from London, uh, the 1910 bottle, has already been emptied. Oh, right, and, that, and the contents are contents in that box? They're in this box here. Okay, yeah. I mean, it's quite lovely. There's like a heart. Um, with pins in it. Is that a bit of cork there? Yeah. And, so, and some human hair. Absolutely, yeah. So um, this a uh, bit of cloth that's been cut to the shape of a heart and kind of pierced with pins. Um, and then a bit of cork, a bit of human hair that were all placed inside this bottle. Um, then the bottle, um, this bottle was excavated um, by Warren in London, uh, in Westminster. Um, and this bottle has stuff in it. We don't we do know exactly it has been emptied before, um, but we haven't really analysed or, you know, properly um looked at the contents of this box in relation in this of this bottle in relation to kind of what it means. Is it similar to these? And I'm sure my colleagues will explain, you know, there's lots of different things that go into these bottles. Um, so yeah. And and are these the the records of when these bottles actually arrived at the Pit Rivers as yeah, well? Yeah, so when they arrived in 1910, they were added into the accession book. Um, so uh, recording here um, what Warren knew about the bottles and Warren himself refers to it as a witch bottle. Um, so he kind of knew what he was collecting um, and the index card, which um, interestingly, so the index cards, um, which you can see behind us are arranged by um, geographical region and type. So this whole set of index cards are um, charms, amulets and Gosh. witchcraft. So all objects um, pertaining to that. So, Nigel, but what, what are these bottles? What are witch bottles? OK, witch bottles are containers, containers of prepared cures against bewitchment. What you're looking at, really, and what the project is looking at, is the beginning of bottle magic in this country in the mid to late 17th century. Bewitchment and responses to bewitchment go have a lot more resonance going back in time and have normally have herbal remedies associated with them. But at some point, for whatever reason, in the mid to late 17th century, bottle magic becomes one of the procedures which can be used, a curative procedure which can be used against witchcraft. The bottles themselves, however, and this is a frequent association, are not actually made as witch bottles. They are reused as witch bottles. Right, so these bottles that people look at them and they go, right, I've got a witch bottle. Correct. They're not witch bottles. Correct. And it's a, Who makes them? And it's a frequent something <laughs> I see in, often in museum collections or on social media, someone even in some museum catalogues and, um, you know, and displays, there is the association somehow which is made between these bottles being witch bottles, and that is not the case. In terms of answering your question, Raksha, these bottles are made in Germany. Um, they are stoneware, impervious, highly fired, and they are made in their tens of thousands in the period from about 1550 to 1700 in uh, a production centres just situated outside of Frecken, which is near the um, city of Cologne. They were then shipped up the Rhineland uh, and then, um, you know, taken by uh, Dutch ships uh, from the Dutch ports redistributed wildly, I, uh, wild, um, widely even, sorry, you know, to, um, I quite to, like wildly though. <laughs> to, to locations across the globe. I think of them as the Coke can of the day. They are shipped, however, empty. They do not necessarily have their contents in them necessarily, and they would 
there to hold any form of liquid. Dutch genre paintings of the late 17th century, of course, shown them principally used for um, containing alcoholic beverages, but um, shipwrecks um, show that they would also be shipped out to the East Indies containing mercury, for example. So they have, oh. a, they have a sort of medical scientific mm. kind of use as well, just because of what they are. Uh, and um, what the, the great feature of these bottles, uh, you know, themselves, of course, is the application of the uh, of the face mask. Well, of, that's it's a quite a jolly uh, bearded man, isn't there? On it the is, front? and the German the Germans refer to them as Bartman, which literally is the translation as bearded man. And they often would also have these medallions applied to them as well. Uh, the um, the example from London, from Westminster, which we're viewing here on the right. As the uh, coat of arms of the uh, you know electors of the uh, the seven electors the electors of the uh, Holy Roman Empire, whereas this one here on our left, which is the Norwich bottle, which we're going to be opening presently, uh, dates uh, sorry has uh, you know this sort of petal rosette. So the most important thing to sort of stress here about them is the fact that actually. These bottles are not witch bottles; they become witch bottles. They are reused as witch bottles at the point when these various, when this sort of the various contents are added to them. Now, principally, these don't always survive in museum collections. So we know from the textual evidence, for example, that they could be urine, it could be salt, it could be mercury crops up a few times as well. Um, but principally, what we what is always added to them, this is the sort of the concurrent theme, is the um, addition of iron objects such as nails uh, and pins, uh, and indeed, uh, you know, on occasion, felt hearts like you're seeing here. Gosh, so really they are what I could presume as the Tupperware of its day. They were just produced, they were sent out, especially during times of empire to different parts of the globe. And it's only the process by putting the objects in that it suddenly becomes a witch bottle. Yeah, the addition of the contents is what makes them the witch bottles, uh, what makes them witch bottles. And of course, witch bottles are practiced as something which is practiced today across the globe and also is still practiced, you know, if you look on YouTube, any form of social media, you will see people recreating and remaking witch bottles. The so do you also get witch bottles that aren't these vessels as well? From time to time, yes. There's not always a clear association. Whilst it's absolutely clear that in the mid to, mid to late 17th century, such was the ubiquity of these bottles in circulation in, 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 in England at the time and so widely traded that these clearly are the preferred choices and we'll be coming on to perhaps exploring reasons why that is the fact that obviously one part of the ritual or the creation of these bottles means that they have to be heated. These are particularly well suited to being heated. Okay, but there are other examples of, uh, you know, of, of, of the practice dated to the mid to late 17th century which are found where they're using earthenware vessels as well. Yes. Well I'm really looking forward to looking at the contents of, of that one really. So. Um... Faye, could you do the honours, please? Sure. So, <laughs> um, so I'm going to uh, the Norwich bottle. Um, I'm from 1893. I'm going to tip it out and hopefully um, the contents will nicely <laughs> fall onto this pre-prepared tray. So um, I should just say before I do that, it, with a museum artifact, ordinarily um, would maybe use something like an endoscope or you know something um, kind of non-destructive. We wouldn't really want to upset or um, uh, disturb the artifact if it came into the museum we want to preserve it as is and um, the fact that this has already been unstoppered and it's been emptied in the past means that you know that's okay for us to yeah, do today sure. um, so here goes gosh there there is something inside there isn't there well, lots of detritus and I can definitely see some pins and nails and I, I love it how the research team are craning their necks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having to um, kind of shake it a bit because, yeah, there's the bigger bits that I think was getting kind of a bit stuck and coming out. And I, oh. I can still hear Oof. that there's still some. There's loads of stuff in there. Uh, okay. uh, oh, presumably okay. quite hard there for, to have put it in in the first place. Absolutely. Mm. So you know. um, I might actually. Oh, Ooh. no, there's. Wow. There it is. Um, There's a, a big old bent nail there coming out. You know what, I think that there is one more thing. I'm just going to use the torch to um, <laughs> see what's causing it to not come out, really. Um, okay. Another bit of metal in there, so it's not really... It will eventually come out, I'm sure. Wanting to... Um... <laughs> at, least, at least we don't have animals as ah, well. Got it. Ah. Yay. 
There we go. <laughs> okay. That, that is it. That is <laughs> I'm it. pretty sure that that is it. Okay. I'll okay. So, we'll Michael, you've been looking at the contents, haven't you, of these bottles? So, you've been visiting yeah. lots of museums and their archives. You'd be going and looking at all of these uh, witch bottles in museum collections and you'd be looking at the insides of them. Would you say that this is typical of what they've been finding? Yeah, we've, we've visited uh, museums uh, all over um, kind of uh, Eastern England, really, um, to, to try and look at these rare examples where the contents still survive. Because quite often there's older records that say, you know, we found a witch bottle and there was some iron in it. Um, but what, what part of the project, what we're trying to do is really sort of get at the detail of the, of the act, what they choose to put inside uh, and the, the, the whole process of that, really. Uh, and so just having a, a quick initial look at what we've got here. Um, well, for a start, most of these things are made out of iron, and that is a kind of common theme. Uh, nails are almost ubiquitous where we have surviving contents, and that might be because they are kind of cheap and widely available, like the bottles themselves, um, or it might be uh, because of their, their particular characteristics, because they're you know, sharp and pointy. Um, because the other thing that that's fairly ubiquitous, and what I'm separating out here at the moment, um, is the fact that you do tend to find copper um, alloy pins, normally brass pins made out of wire, which again are... So are those pins, they're like dressmaker's pins, aren't they? Yeah, basically they're, they're, they're used for a range of kind of textile working and dress purposes. Um, so, so certain people today would be bristling with them. They're very cheap. They're things that you'd have in most households. Um, so, you know, these aren't uh, sort of rarefied magical materials, these are sort of common objects. And as we've you know, looked at the contents of these bottles, we've quite often found um, uh, sort of evidence that the bits of iron, for example, are sort of reused bits of scrap think, and things like that. Um, you know, rivets from objects that have already been used and broken down, um, you know, recycled um, bits of things. And those larger bits of iron, I'm presuming that they're iron, yeah, absolutely. They kind of look almost like roof tile <laughs> nails, don't they? Yeah, they're, It's absolutely. funny how they're all bent as well and they're kind of misshapen and they've been like squished together. Yeah, so, so some of these are um, from nails. Uh, I think we've got the cross section of an uh, iron blade here um, from, a, from a little iron knife. Oh, right. So that, there's um, like the end that would have gone into the handle there, isn't there? Or yeah, whatever. exactly. Um, and a couple of these are from uh, staples or joiners dogs, which are you know, fittings to keep woods together. What we don't obviously have here are some of the sort of uh, organic elements, uh, things like the, the cloth heart that, um, that we had in the, the, the London bottle, um, or the, the hair and the nails. And of course, as uh, uh, a really important element of the stuff that goes into these, which we know about um, from the written sources, is urine, which we can perhaps pick up using scientific analysis, but doesn't tend to survive um, in, the, in museum That's collections. probably for the best, though, isn't it? <laughs> yes. It would be less pleasant looking through this stuff. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know what I was expecting, but um, I was kind of hoping for clumps of hair to come out and nail clippings, but I'm surprised there's so much dirt in there. Yeah, well, some of this is iron oxide, so it's rust um, from the iron objects. Uh, some of this might might be dirt, and we'll uh, and you know now that we've uh, emptied out this bottle, we'll be able to take a closer look at that really. And we are really looking at these objects in detail because one of the things that we're really interested in is how they're treating these objects. There are sort of recurrent patterns um, in terms of things being deliberately bent or broken. Um, you know, it's perhaps part of the ritual looking at you know, exactly what objects people choose to include, whether they always use the same numbers and just, just trying to define what the, the different sort of variables within the ritual practice is and see if there's any sort of geographical or temporal patterning. But uh, I'm also guessing that if we were doing this with an intact vessel with the contents in it, we would treat it very much um, in an archaeological way, wouldn't we? Where, you know, the way that similar way that we would treat cremation burial, where we would be very careful in recovering it, um, maybe x-raying it to see if there's like a way in which things were deposited inside it. I mean, we, you know, the fact that this has already been opened and been knocked around is yeah. uh, is another thing, really. Absolutely. It, it, it completely affects how we, how we approach this, really. Um, so if it's an undisturbed bottle, um, it 
uh, that someone say found, finds in their house, it's a really good idea to get in touch with archaeologists before you go any further because there's all sorts of information that you can capture um, about the orientation of the bottle, um, about perhaps the order that the, the objects went into the bottle and we can do, as you say, things like x-raying or an endoscope, as Faye was saying, um, to have a look inside, we do various types of scientific sampling as well. Uh, so, you know, all of these different elements help uh, build up a really detailed um, picture of the sort of series of choices that are getting made every time someone's compiling one of these switch bottles and the, and the different ingredients and the different order of things. So, Kerry, the order, <coughs> that's what I want to know. I mean, what makes this a witch bottle? How, how do you put one together? Um, I mean, we'd love to know that the, the order that things were going into them. Um, I think really to, to understand the witch bottle, it's to understand what, why it was being made to begin with. Um, so it would be a case of somebody who was suffering from a certain disease or certain misfortunes or perhaps um, an animal, a horse, a cow, um, was suffering. And the, the fear was that they were bewitched. So a, a witch had cursed them, um, whether they knew who that witch was or not. Um, in most cases, they didn't. They just they they were worried that they were bewitched, so they would go to um, a cunning person, who I'm sure Owen can tell us more about in a moment, um, and they would be prescribed um, making one of these witch bottles. Um, and it is really important to see it as kind of medical magic. So it's not just purely magic. These aren't curses. These were um, kind of medically prescribed to to counteract um, a witch's curse or to prevent stop the witch from cursing so uh, if something was going wrong in your life i don't know maybe somebody was ill or as you said you know uh, your animal had gone dead or your crops mm -hmm. failed you would go and see somebody mm -hmm. yeah yeah um so you'd go and see a cunning person and they would prescribe one of these bottles um and really the thinking behind these bottles is sympathetic magic um, which kind of underpin, underpin a lot of... Oh, what does that mean? <laughs> what is sympathetic magic? <laughs> it's, it's a hard concept to explain, um, but really it is the belief that you could impact one thing based on its close relationship to something else. Um, so, for instance, you could take um, a personal item, so something that's been worn close to the body maybe, and you could separate it from the person, so take it away. But what you did to that object would influence the person as well. Um, so you could damage the object and it would harm the person. So it's a bit like, I don't know, what we would use now as a good luck charm, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's all about creating a link between yourself and the bottle. So the victim, the, the person who believes that they're bewitched, makes a connection by putting certain items into the bottle. Um, so we've already mentioned urine being a key ingredient. So the victim would, would place their urine inside it. Um, and that creates a, a connection between themselves and the bottle, but also with the witch and the suspected witch, because through cursing, the witch is already connected to the victim. So it becomes kind of like a triangle of connection. So you have the, the bottle containing the urine and other items, which is connected to the victim, who is connected to the witch. Um, so what happens to the bottle also impacts the witch. Um, so having the urine suggests that maybe the connection was specifically to the witch's bladder, um, or maybe to the heart, perhaps that's where we're getting the, the cloth heart. And by putting these objects in, so these sharp metallic objects, um, imagine that they're going into kind of the witch's bladder and the amount of pain that it's causing. So these are meant to be kind of objects of torment, really. Um, so you're getting kind of needles, nails, pins, but you're also getting fawns, um, glass fragments. So anything that's sharp and um, that will cause the witch enough pain that they will be identified um, and they will lift the curse or they may die um, and then the curse will be lifted. Um, so, yeah, it's all about establishing that connection. And that's why you're seeing um, hair and um, nail pairings there as well, because these are kind of objects from the body and that's strengthening that link. Oh, right. So the witch has bewitched you. It's something that's personal to you. So you have to put something personal about your own person into mm -hmm. there to try and then counter curse that. <laughs> yeah. Wow, yeah. that's very complicated. I <laughs> oh, and we've actually got a few questions, you know. So um, one is, uh, how common are witch bottles? Yeah, this, it's that's... really, 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 really good question. The, 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 the short answer is not very, OK? To date, we've found 146 examples of the mid to late 17th century practice, these containers, OK? 
Not only that, they are very, very specifically ge geographically located in England. Okay, so this is where the practice of bottle magic begins. Right, so it's not Britain-wide then. It becomes British-wide later in the 19th century, but by then, the notion of the witch bottle has got mixed up with all sorts of different things. So it's not the same as what we're looking at here. Okay, it's very different, very different. So where we've found them, you know, for example, is that they're very, very much located in the eastern counties of England. Okay, so that is principally Suffolk, Norfolk, Cambridgeshire, quite a few examples from London, Kent, and then really it then sort of extends in the sort of range of three to four to five in places like East and West Sussex and Hampshire, where the, well, most of the evidence is, well, all of the evidence from Hampshire, for example, is from one village alone. Gosh, from something, must have, something bad must have been happening from there. An and, and the interesting <laughs> thing is as well is that whilst most witch bottles have been, um, you know, are, have been found from um, renovations of what are now historic buildings, okay? And there's little um, question that, that most witch bottles were found from the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s. And almost all the examples from Suffolk, for example, were found up in from between the 1950s, 60s and 70s, and it seems as though that none have been found since. So it's very kind of geographically determinate, but that's determined on the fact that these are prescribed cures and remedies, and that you're not looking at something which is kind of well known to everybody, okay? Because let's face it, the fear of witches, uh, of bewitchment, of being cursed, whatever these kind of quite loaded terms we're using here, has something which resonates across the continent and it resonates across the British Isles. So witch bottles are something which are very peculiar to England for a very short period of time say, uh, you know, using these Bartman jugs as the containers. And what happens in the mid to eight, you know, by the time you get to the early 18th century, there isn't much evidence of them anymore. And then it picks up again the 19th century, but it's kind of mixed up with lots of other things by that point. Well, that's yeah. the thing, isn't it? I think on social media, we've been getting some really interesting traction, especially when we said that we were having this event, uh, you know, this whole kind of idea of uh, being extremely superstitious. I mean, do you see that, that this whole kind of superstition just kind of travels through the ages. You know, there's, you can't unleash, you, uh, you know, another pandemic on us, if you open this, we're gonna be cursed. You know, do you, do you get this, that we're, we're brought into this psyche? There is always going to be fear of the unknown, fear of something that we don't understand and fear of something that we can't control. Um, I might've been a little bit mm, if we hadn't, or if this hadn't already been open previously, um, because I, I do understand that there's a lot of a lot of beliefs we're into um, the making of these bottles, and there are still a lot of beliefs out there about making kind of contemporary witch bottles. Um, so, kind of fear and anxiety is is completely understandable, um, and it does you know it's timeless really. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Well, what about you, Michael? Because you're normally you're a Romanist, aren't you? So what are you doing here? <laughs> I mean, like, but for me, I, as an archaeologist, I can see this kind of continuation of the bending metal in like a ritual purpose. It reminds me of, you know, lead curse tablets in uh, Roman bath or, you know, around hidden lead rolls in monasteries. Do you think the same thing? Well, I don't think that necessarily the meanings identical but there are these sorts of common threads um, in terms of uh, objects that get used in kind of magical processes and um, sacrificial processes and things like that um, uh, you know through the centuries so you know some of these ideas that we're talking about about things being deliberately bent and destroyed I mean that uh, could be a way of sort of moving things from the mundane into the sort of the world of magic and, and the and the sort of spiritual sides of things, um, a way of, of kind of sacrificing things, using things up as a, you know, as a part of an ingredient, the sort of materia magica of compiling uh, these witch bottles. I think the, the really nice things about where we do have the surviving contents is that by looking at uh, material closely, we can try and reconstruct the exact um, sort of series of decisions and processes that go into it. So for example, the pins, sometimes they're found straight, sometimes they're found, they're found bent in very specific ways, uh, either bent once or kind of Z-shaped bends. Mm -hmm. And you know, are these bits of information about how individual um, people, like individual types of knowledge about how to compile these witch bottles, you know, what, what, what can these little variations in how people um, are, are putting them all together tell us really? 
and there's some and there's some records for it. There's, there's there's some witch bottles um, formed from Hellington in Norfolk. Um, I wonder about whether or not sort of you know efficacy or strength kind of mattered because there's some there's, there's some witch bottles which have bonkers contents in them. So whilst they may well have, you well, know, defi nails. Define bonkers contents. Bonkers contents. Bonkers, <laughs> bonkers con one, one, for example, is one from Hellington in, uh, in, um, in, in Norfolk, uh, which I think has sort of parts of either a Dutch or French Bible script, manuscript sort of uh, cut up and sort of added you, into you it. You really don't associate witchcraft and magic with the use of the Bible. Yeah, you, you know, it's, it's ma magical. The term we like to use is magical medical for example, and that's how we need to sort of think and situate these objects. So, you know, um, what Michael's talking about in terms of, you know, sort of you know, understanding the trends and understanding, you know, the different contents. Some of them, for example, contain, uh, you know, bits of the body, which is what Kerry was talking about uh, as important for sympathetic magic, uh, you know, principally nails uh, and, you know, uh, and, and hair as well, but a lot of them don't. You know, and then there's others which, um, you know, which, um, as I said, have these sort of bonkers contents, but the main thing that does connect them, just to build on what my colleagues were saying, is, is the use of nails. Uh, and that's something which runs through which bottles of the 17th century to ones of the 19th century to ones of the 20th century. That's, that seems to be the sort of common thread. So that's really interesting, I think, you know, as well. Yeah. All right, so Owen, mm. I've made my witch bottle. I've put my bodily parts into it. I've mm. had a good wee into it. Bent some nails and pins. Then what? Two options, and all, all this would have been advised by a specialist. We've already heard mention of, of a cunning person, cunning man, cunning woman. The majority were men at this period, but there were a significant minority of cunning women as well. Uh, and these are the people who were advising this. So people, people weren't learning themselves how to construct a witch box. Oh, right. So they weren't doing it themselves. They were going, no. they were getting expert a specialist, help. A specialist in un underwitching, a specialist in dealing with witches. And these, these people were called cunning folk. And that's why it's a bit of a misnomer in one sense to call these witch bottles, because they're not called that at the time. There is not one reference in the late 17th or early 18th century where these are referred. They're always referred to as a bottle, an earthen bottle, which you then put the contents in. First time we get the term witch bottle to describe these is actually in the 1840s in a museum collection. So, yeah, we have to be a bit careful. Mm. Uh, but it's cunning folk who are, who are doing these. They're the ones who are either doing the ritual on behalf of a client or they're instructing the client quite in detailed ways about what they're meant to do. So who are these cunning folk? Well, we have to remember at this time, late 17th century, there's still laws against witches. Although the trials themselves have really wound down, the last person to be executed for witchcraft is in the 1680s, so it's just, just in the time when these are being used. But we have to remember that, um, you know, people who were prosecuted for being suspected witches, who were tried for them, are just, that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's a whole raft of daily rituals and procedures against witches. So if you, if you fear you're bewitched, you might go to the magistrate and see if you can get them prosecuted. But that, that's, it costs time, it costs money. Magic can be much cheaper, popular magic. And so you might not go to the law, you'll go to a cunning person who will then advise to do this. And for example, the iron objects we see there, the nails, the nails are there because they're sharp, as, as, as Kerry has said. But they're also there because iron is a really, really important anti-witch charm in this period. And particularly old iron, you get references in the 16th century to saying, pick up a bit of old iron and that will really help you. Put it in your house, put it up by the door, like a horseshoe. Hmm. Horseshoe is a potent anti-witch charm because of the iron, essentially, at this time. So it's, there's a knowledge between all of these and cunning folk are the people who seem to have all that knowledge. And so when you went to them and said you were bewitched, and a number of cunning folk were offering this service. Only a few, as we know, it's geographical, and that's probably down to a handful, maybe, of cunning folk doing this sort of practice, and it, clients coming to them from up to 30, 40 miles away, or whatever, or travelling uh, by barge they, or whatever around the they coast. They sound like dodgy salesmen to they, me. They, well, yeah, <laughs> some of them are clearly, clearly quite unsavoury characters. Uh, some of them aren't. There's a whole spectrum. What they are is entrepreneurial. And so when we talk about, Nigel's talking about bonkers content, that's because they're making it up. There's the, there's the essentials, and that they had their own touch. You know, you come to me. So felt hearts, you know, there's only a handful of those. I'm pretty sure it's just one kind of person who kind of, that's their signature, which wow. bottle, so to speak, at this time. But when, when, once, once you've gone to them and they've advised it, there's, there's two, two ways in which um, the bottle is used once all the contents are in. Um, one way is you put it on the fire uh, and you boil it, and that's what really gets all the contents agitated. That's the sympathetic magic that Kerry's talking about. And that's what, her, you know, it's, it's meant to harm the bladder of the witch or the heart. She, because it's mostly, of course, most of those accused of witchcraft were women. 
she would then come to the door and reveal herself and say, take it off, you know, stop, 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 I will take off the spell. You know? So it's partly identifying the witch and it's partly about, you know, causing so much pain to her as, as the, she's caused pain to you um, that she desists. Um, and, and as part of that, what would happen, you'd boil and boil and boil and maybe the cork would pop out and that would be the end of the ritual. You know, it's done. Um, occasionally, um, they would explode. Uh, and this <laughs> no could be thanks. quite serious. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exploding nails and urine flying at you. And indeed, we have one case from the early 18th century where one of these earthenware witch bottles, I think it was a bigger flagon to do with uh, bewitched cows, exploded and basically took a man's face off. Oh, ow. Um, you know, they could Awful. destroy half a building if these one of these just weren't, because it's like a bit like a grenade almost, you know, the pressure in it. Um, so it's quite dangerous doing that, that ritual. Um, but the reason these survive is the second one, which is actually to bury it. Hmm. And that's why there's no burn marks on these at all. These were buried, and that's kind of the more long-term protection against the suspected witch, to make sure that there's always this there, that if she causes any harm, it's constantly rumbling away there. There's the nails in this, even if it's not being boiled at this, at this period. And that's why we find these. What, you know, we don't find ones which have been, well, we wouldn't know, as archaeologists find it difficult to sift through fragments of a, of a, of a Bartman jug to say, oh, this is an exploded witch bottle. So, you know, there, there's the unknown there in, in terms of that type of ritual. So th th this whole idea of concealing a bottle, that's all part of it as well then? Yeah. Yeah, the concealment is, is one, I think in the essence is about, you're, you're basically providing a barrier from, the, from, you don't want the accused witch, suspected witch, getting hold of the bottle, because she would then be back in control of that relationship. Um, and then she could use, ultimately, potentially use the contents in it through simple magic to, to cause more harm again as well. But this, this, is, this is just one ritual of many, many anti-witchcraft charms and spells. I say iron, iron was used widely. It's, it's really interesting that this whole like um, theme of metal, mm. you know, it seems to like run through the ages. I always like think that, you know, creating metal itself is a magical process, isn't it? Do you think that's why people use metal? It's, it's really difficult. I mean, one, one, one of the early folklorists in the late 19th century thought it was because this was a kind of an echo of the first uh, people doing metal work and the, the aura of the blacksmith and the aura and, and speciality and, and, and mysteriousness of making metal, down the ages had somehow been translated into this being uh, anti which It's also anti-fairy as well, um, iron as well. It's a nice theory, but you know, again, it's one of the things, there's no evidence for it. And you could say, okay, well, why not copper, which came before the Iron Age? You know, why, why isn't copper considered to have these properties? So I don't know, it's a, it is a mystery. I mean, in, in Ireland, in the, uh, 18th century, um, it was it was considered because St. Patrick had blessed iron and therefore that it had all these properties. Mm. But that's just one specific tradition. So it is, it is part of the mystery still about uh, of the origins of iron as an anti-witchcraft uh, element. I think we've got, oh, we've got tons of questions. <laughs> tons and tons, right. So somebody's already asked, um, can they be x-rayed to find out what's inside before before opening them? I suppose. Yeah, they could be x-rayed. You can use um, XRF, so uh, fluorescence, and by x-raying them, you'd see the contents before having to empty them out like this. Um, and with an x-ray, you would identify, I suppose, the bigger bits of um, metal and, and even the smaller bits of, coin, of uh, pin, I guess. And then I suppose there are um, scientific methods. So again, the XRF would tell you if you wanted to identify exactly that it definitely is iron, it's an alloy, it's a you know, brass, what metal it is, and if there is any organic matter in it. So yeah, X-ray would be a good idea. Yep. Would the fact that iron is magnetic be significant? Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> all, all, all I can say is when you, when you look at the earliest references, published references to, mm. to iron in the 16th, 17th centuries as iron as a witchcraft, they don't talk about. They don't, it's not mentioned at all in the sources, put it that way. Doesn't mean that that isn't part of the reason, but it's not mentioned. The part of the charm of including iron. Yeah. Right, okay. All right, so why do we call them bellamines? Uh, well, this is my thing. Bellamine <laughs> is a very... <laughs> Bellamine is something which, in, which is it, the, the named after Cardinal Bellamine, okay, who was a late, ooh, I'm going to get my chronology wrong here, he was, I think, a 16th century Italian cardinal who was particularly against Protestants. However, the association of Cardinal Bellamine 
with these jugs because you're right, they're, they're normally called belamites. And that's because when they first start getting reported and recorded in, and start entering museum collections in the 19th century, there was a, like a knowledge that, you know, these things had been called belamine jugs. And you, you find them referred to in, um, I think there's a few plays from the 17th century where they're called belamine jugs. And that's because of the association with, uh, it's not really association with the face, but it's because it's like, it's, it's the English, what's the word for it? Perhaps almost during this period, obsession with Catholicism. And so because Cardinal Bellarmine was a kind of, you know, anti-Protestant, because, you know, he was uh, also sort of, you know, associated with that anti sort of drinking and sort of, you know, all those kind of northern, more northern European cultural uh, traits, um, the English named these jugs Bellarmine jugs. And that's represented, as I said, in other contemporary literature of the 17th century. So that's why. And the name's just stuck. It's stuck in kind of, you know, the ways that when they're, when they're first found and reported and they first start getting entered into museum collections in the 19th century, they're often called Bellarmine jugs. And it doesn't, the, the face doesn't look like Cardinal Bellarmine. Yeah, it doesn't look like Cardinal <laughs> Bellarmine has got, you know, the chronology is all wrong as well. And, and the Germans and nobody, else, and nobody else in Europe refers to them as Bellarmine jugs. It's just a peculiarly English practice of the 17th century, just like which bottles are, in fact. So we should really refer to them as Bartman jugs. Bartman is the German, you know, uh, okay. bearded man. Indeed, that's what they Interesting. They for, yeah. Oh, somebody would like to see the felt heart and they'd like to see the items. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. It's a very interesting. Michael or, you know, Faye, yeah. you could... Oh, there you go. You had a good look at them, didn't you, Michael? The... So we have, we have actually got a, an archival reference to someone putting a heart in under the recommendation of a kind of book in 1670. So we do actually have a, 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 an archival reference to that practice. I mean, I'll, I'll yeah. take a photo of them as well. Yeah. So um, yeah. we'll, that'll be up on social media so you can have a look at those as well closely. So, oh, this is interesting. Have any been found in Essex? Apparently, the last cunning man was based in Essex. Correct. That would be cunning mural. Yeah, no, oh, yeah. it's not sure the last one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The last, maybe notorious or famous one. Yeah, who's yeah, yeah. Cunning Murrell. Cunning Murrell. Yeah, he was quite. Do we have a story? There, well, there is. There is a story about Cunning Murrell. In fact, as it, as it happened, because he actually practiced and experimented with. And there were a couple of cunning folk in the nineteenth century who practiced um, experimenting with iron witch bottles, reusables. They thought they, they again. Oh, they're entrepreneurial. Iron again. They're entrepreneurial. They thought so. They got a blacksmith to create, and Murrell did this as well. Got a blacksmith to create iron bottles that they could reuse. Uh, so you would do the boiling ritual, the cork would pop out, cunning person with uh, like cunning Murrell would take the bottle back again. Problem was in the both two occasions um, that we have references to this, the iron bottle exploded under the pressure. Now you can imagine an iron bottle filled with uh, with well obviously urine uh, exploding. It was even worse than um, one of those earthenware bottles. And we actually have uh, the records of in the late 1790s of uh, a cunning person instructing an iron bottle for a client who then did it, it exploded and tore half his house apart and killed him. Oh. And we have the records and we even have his, we have yeah. his burial details. So dangerous stuff. And Cunning Morrill also did that and it took half a, half a cottage half his with, cottage. It, yeah, that's right. with yeah. it, with him as well. I believe yeah. Call of Cunning Morrill's archive as such as it exists is in Southend Museum, yeah. I believe. Yeah. Sounds like loads of shrapnel going Yeah, shrapnel. It's like a hand, yeah, it's like, it would be like a hand grenade. Yeah. Coming off the splinters everywhere, it was it was absolute, you know. But was, he was obviously well known scene. because he's yeah. in the records. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Newspapers reported on this. Yeah, uh, on, on his activities. You know, when mm -hmm. he turned up in the village to deal with a witch, hundreds would turn out and see what he was going to do. Yeah. Wow. So the, yeah, so these <laughs> these people are still circulating in society up until the nineteenth century. Yeah. You know, and still practicing a form of witch bottle, which is kind of taking its its roots and its knowledge from the mid to late 17th century ones we've got here. I mean, the interesting thing is also about the kind of records is that, you know, is that there's, um, there's a court record from the Old Bailey, which talks about boiling urine and uh, nails in a pipkin, which is like a kind of three, uh, three footed uh, tripod mm. vessel, earthenware vessel. Uh, there are other examples from the 1580s uh, and from the 1640s, which talk about boiling urine in pans mm. and nails in pans. But the whole point is, is that these things do not survive or have not survived or archaeologists have not been looking for, you know, old bits of pans with bits of fused nails on them. So consequently, the focus has always been on 
the survival of the Bartman jug and its association as being a witch bottle. So they're almost like, um, I, I, what's the word I'm kind of looking for here? Perhaps they've been sort of slightly kind of raised above the parapet a little bit more than perhaps they actually were. In fact, there's a whole range of other vessels that we know could have been used for them. And, and, and bottle magic, as I said, it seems to begin about the 1670s, 80s, and that corresponds with the first written records as well. The dates of the bottles seem to date from this period as well. But before that, there's records of people essentially carrying out what you might you know, include as being the contents of a witch bottle much earlier, but in like saucepans and pipkins and things like that. So is it, would you say it's easy to say that what we're looking at here is negative evidence. Yeah. These are the yeah. things that survive. Yep. But actually the practice was yep, much indeed. more widely used. And, and, yeah. and just, just part of the, you know, medical magical responses which people were using for bewitchment. It wasn't just you could do a witch bottle. You know, there'll be, you look at the records of Nicholas Culpepper, for example, he talks about using, uh, again, quicksilver, silver mercury, and putting it in a quill or a pen and burying it just outside your house. You know, so it, it, they're part of something much bigger, which because historians and archaeologists haven't necessarily been sort of talking to each other, and certainly when these bottles were first uh, raised, their profile was by an archaeologist and museum in London curator called Ralph Merrifield. Uh, you know, he was writing in the 1950s, uh, and, you know, at that sort of particular point, there wasn't that kind of sort of multidisciplinary culture perhaps we now uh, have within, um, within um, you know, the humanities to do this sort of work and you know there wasn't the um you know the online searches you could do on you know on uh, digitized newspapers uh, and accounts from the period in which you could search for all the different uh, you know records really it is, it is to follow on from, yeah. from your point about negative evidence um archaeologists identify these or owners identify them because they're they're ones that are found in buildings where in fact that one there was in fact found in a mill dam bank in london there's other ones which have been found in the yeah. banks of rivers. Well, there's a literary evidence that of a coming advisor putting it in a dung heap. So the ones that we identify Ooh. is because they're in houses. We, you know, if you found one in a London dung heap, a uh, uh, Bartman, would you automatically assume it was a witch bottle and do, you know, and treat it that way? Yeah. Well, actually, that segues into my next question, which is, have there been any intentionally destroyed witch bottles found in archaeological contexts? i.e. breaking the magic, breaking the bottle, discarding the pieces with the contents. Yeah, I mean, there are some which we've... It's really hard. There are, there are some which are found. Uh, there's some um, in the um, collections of Colchester Museum uh, and, um, you know, where the bottles have been really kind of completely smashed up and broken and you've still got the contents still in the base. So whether or not that, ref that reflects one of these ones which what, um, um, you know, uh, Owen was talking about, ones which had been exploded, or just merely the fact that when they were found, you know, part of the bottle was broken here, part of the bottle was broken here, or just merely just didn't, de de didn't get deposited together, we don't know. But there is no evidence of the ones which Owen was describing where they've been exploded you know, at all, and none of them display any evidence of being heated as well. And I think maybe our next kind of, you know, uh, our next kind of experiment um, would be to uh, get one of these bottles replicas <laughs> made and try one of these culling moral like experiments and heat it up and see what happens under completely safe circumstances. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know. as long as there's like some form of bulletproof glass, <laughs> yeah, I'm, indeed, I'm all you know. up for that. <laughs> yeah, but it would be really interesting to sort of heat them and see how long, you know, these things are very impervious. Stoneware is the highest fired ceramics you can make. So to have it something where a situation where it explodes, when you're looking at a, a domestic fire, uh, you know, domestic fireplace in the 17th century when they're not using coal, they're using wood to get it up to that kind of temperature. Mm -hmm. Definitely a case for experimental archaeology, I feel, coming on here. I've got an, an, another lovely question from somebody who used to work with me. <laughs> <laughs> they said that. Um, the, have there been found, have remains of any been found on graveyard sites in Suffolk? Is it common for them to be found in graveyards or in other ways associated with the dead? The answer to that is yes. There are, there is one found, and again, it, it, you can see how the materiality shifts here. There's one from the 18th century, mid 18th century, which is in glass, which is found in a, found in a grave um, in, um, from a, an excavation in Buckinghamshire somewhere. I can't, I can't recall it now. And it's interesting, that's in glass, 
and it has all of the con it has all the sort of the elements of a witch bottle, the witch bottle in terms of the contents. The contents is what makes it a witch bottle. So it's got the it's got the pins which are broke which are broken in, uh, and it's still got the liquid intact. But unfortunately, you know, for conservation reasons, we couldn't open it. Uh, and it, what what the interesting thing is is that it has the cork with the nails stabbed into it, and that's the first example we've got of that practice. And there are others which are reported which are in glass which have been found from graveyards, but there is, uh, but principally from the sort of foundations of, you know, churches and so on. But I think that could be mixed up to do with perhaps creations of love magic, or indeed it just because simply because I think there was kind of quite, when Merrifield was still writing, what he was really interested in was, you know, he was very much taken in by the idea of sort of foundation deposits. And I think some witch bottles which aren't witch bottles, have been recorded as being witch bottles. And I think some of the ones from grave, from churches, for example, are examples of that. But that's for all of us to sort of figure out in due course. There are, there are a few 19th century examples. Yeah. Cunning folk advising putting the churchyard. But as Nigel says, in one, one instance from Cornwall, it was actually a wart charm. In other words, mm. uh, the bottle with urine and, and things put in it was for against warts. Yeah. So we've got another one saying more about the inclusions. Um, have any rowan berries or wood twigs been found in any? Ooh. Ooh. There's, there's, we certainly find um, thorns um, inside some witch bottles, so there are organic elements. I guess one of the, the real challenges for us studying these sorts of things is that um, whether or not these survive uh, organics will depend on the sort of burial circumstances um, of the bottles. So organic elements might have been a bit more common than we might expect. You know, the, the very fact that urine seems to be absolutely prevalent, but that doesn't survive. Um, you know, perhaps a few more bottles had felt hearts or hair or or you know these bits of plants, but it's it's quite difficult to to, to say. Um, mm. But but yeah, we so we do have thorns. We do have some of plants going in there, but. It's not a common thing to discuss. Yeah, the, to discuss. yeah the, the, you know, what, what, you, what you often find is that, you know, the uh, sort of museum will have the account that these things con were contained within the bottle at the point that they were found, but often at the point when they either entered the museum collections or, I hate to say it sometimes, subsequently, these things have been lost. Yeah. Right, so we've got a, a question, I think, from the US. It would be great if you could explain the difference between witch bottles of England and those found in the US. Yeah, the ones in, there are examples of it in the, in the United States as well. They always date from the 18th to 19th century and they're always in glass. Okay, glass, you know, glass files and sort of so on. I, I think the problem with the way that they've been interpreted in the US is probably perhaps a problem in the way that they've been interpreted here. That is the, so persuasive is the kind of the narrative of the witch. Uh, and the narrative perhaps of what, you know, Merrifield was initially writing, that people have often sort of, you know, and, and copy and pasted sort of, you know, uh, uh, internet histories which are put to do with witch bottles, that American examples have tend to be interpreted in the same way as the English ones are, of course, we're all the same, right? But it could be the case that the American ones, I think, also need really, really disentangling to think about what they are. I, mean, I have had many uh, inquiries from the States, which I've clearly got clear examples of, uh, you know, 18th century practices of, you know, the creation of a so-called witch bottle, but it's always in glass. Again, there's a shift, there's a material shift away necessarily from using these stoneware bottles as well. So yeah, there are ones from, there are ones, but they tend to be interpreted in the kind of more the witchcraft type, uh, you know, perceptions are sort of placed on them. And maybe that's your next project. Maybe it's my next project, <laughs> yeah. One more very silly question, which amuses me greatly. Is this where the phrase boils my expletive for urine comes from? <laughs> Don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Right then. So uh, I suppose we better close up. Yeah. But can you tell us more information about your project? Who, where should people contact? You have obviously have this history pin site as well. Could you explain more? Jerry. Yes, yeah, so we're, um, we're pinning examples of uh, found concealed bottles um, onto History Pin, which is a, a freely accessible website. So um, just History Pin and then search for Concealed Revealed. Um, and there's quite a few examples there. And we're welcoming anyone, um, any members of the public to pin their own examples, um, just kind of copy our, our template. Um, and please do get in touch. Um, Nigel's already said um, email or Twitter. We'd love to add more. Um, the 
the actual proceedings of our research itself, itself you know, we've published one little article in British Archaeology about it, but the main body of the work is going to be captured in a um, monograph produced by uh, myself and Michael's workplace, MOLA, uh, that will be printed, but also made freely available online as a PDF in due course on the MOLA website. And we're, we're moving into our kind of research writing up phase now of the project, um, you know, um, in the next month or two, which is really exciting for us. And I suppose if anybody finds a witch bottle um, in their house or possibly a dung heap, they should get in contact with you. Absolutely. Absolutely. We'd, we'd, we'd love to hear about it, particularly the ones which are found in a dung heap. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so if you've got any more questions, please still use the witch bottle live hashtag and we will try and personally get back to you yeah. uh, throughout the course of this week, I suppose. It's worth mentioning as well that um, we, um, Owen and Kerry and I were involved in making an animation which was on BBC Arts on the um, Cultures in Quarantine um, you know, website that's still available to November in which we worked with um, a brilliant production company called Calling the Shots uh, to make uh, an animation about um, which bottle practice, which is based on, 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 on a real case of the 1670s and 1680s. And that, you know, that's a nice little five minute animation, which is still available on BBC iPlayer. Life and times of a witch bottle. Life and times of a witch bottle, indeed. <laughs> it's very sweet, actually. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for watching. Thank you for your questions. So goodbye from our brilliant experts. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a goodbye from me. Thank you for thank watching. You.